in the manifesto now posted to the website for the Obey campaign, uh, Ferry has this to say, I quote at length, the Obey sticker attempts to stimulate curiosity and bring people to question both the sticker and their relationship with their surroundings. Because people are not used to seeing advertisements or propaganda for which the product or motive is not obvious, frequent and novel encounters with the sticker provoke thought and possible frustration, nevertheless revitalizing the viewer's perception and attention to detail. The sticker has no meaning, but exists only to cause people to react, to contemplate and search for meaning in the sticker. Because Obey has no actual meaning, the various uh, reactions and interpretations of those who view it reflect their personality and the nature of their sensibilities." End quote. Clearly, uh, to insist that a piece of street art is meaningless is a meaningful message in itself. But if the artist placing stenciled soldiers in strategic locations around Willie Street has the same attitude as Ferry, then my attempts to assess another's personhood through these soldiers uh, has been in, focused in entirely the wrong direction. Like Ferry's audience, I may very well be interpreting a reflection of my own personhood. Ultimately, Tigua style painting is no different. Uh, tourists, promoters, and a variety of scholars have all tended to view Tigua style art as illustrative of rural indigenous life in the Ecuadorian Andes. Uh, nor is this perception entirely mistaken. But there are many elements of contemporary indigenous life that one simply does not see in most paintings. For example, this one. Uh, there are no machines. There are no uh, modern modes of transportation or any signs of them. Nobody's wearing jeans or a t-shirt here. Uh, a practiced eye will note that there are actually quite a few signs of non-indigenous influence on indigenous life. Um, the cinder block house here uh, is one of those aspects. Um, that family is pretty wealthy. And it's, I think, no mistake that the economic symbols of Cotopaxi appear in front of that house instead of some other house. Um, in part, this is a result of the need to conform to consumers' expectations in order to make a sale. As Blanca Muratorio writes, quote, like Gucci and Calvin Klein, both consecrated masters of the market, the indigenous people of the Sierra have mastered the subtleties of the competitive scene and fully understand that they should wear typical clothing and assume appropriate bodily attitudes if they want to legitimize, authenticate, and increase their sales. Uh, Tigua painters produce their artworks in that same spirit. But Moratoyo goes on to point out that the mere existence of this genre, from which non-indigenous items have been eliminated, is a challenge to the dominant white mestizo society. Rudy Coyorello Mansfeld showed quite clearly in a recent article how codes, uh, how the codes according to which artists working in the Tigua style create their art are not necessarily the same codes according to which tourists or anthropologists have generally interpreted them. The need to make sales places a great deal of power in the hands of consumers to dictate what the paintings look like and which messages seem to be conveyed. But like street artists in Madison, Tigua painters can challenge that power by creating some messages that their audiences are simply not in a position to understand. The political potential of Tigua paintings is realized most overtly in works that illustrate events from Ecuador's famously successful indigenous movement. These paintings are uncommon in tourist market stalls, but there are quite a few of them floating around. Unlike the pastoral scenes most popular among tourists, explicitly political paintings often portray specific events in individual people. Uh, and here we have a 2002 painting by Fausto Tuakisa, a perspective on the ouster of President Jamil Mawad two years earlier in 2000. Mawad can be seen at the center of the painting, uh, fleeing the presidential residence with two subordinates, one of whom is carrying a suitcase full of dollars, uh, symbolizing uh, the uh, one of the reasons that Mawad was actually kicked out, which is that he wanted to dollarize the uh, economy. That happened after he left anyway, but there's a sign of it here. Um, the short-lived Junta de Salvación Nacional faces the gathering crowd uh, from the balcony of the Palacio. Lucio Gutierrez holds the microphone. At the time, he was an army colonel, um, 
He was jailed for six months after the coup, uh, was elected president right around the time that Tokisa produced this painting, and then was later removed from office by an act of the Ecuadorian Congress in response to another wave of mass protests. Gutierrez uh, clasps the hand of Antonio Vargas, raising it high in triumph. Vargas was then president of the Confederación de Nacionalidades Indígenas del Ecuador, CONAIE. Um, to the other side of Gutierrez is the third member of the Junta, Carlos Solorzano, then president of Ecuador's Supreme Court. With closer scrutiny, other individuals might also be identifiable. For example, the woman here um, looks like she might be Nina Pacari, another prominent indigenous politician. And I would imagine that uh, some of these other people are identifiable as well. Um, I don't recognize them, but I think somebody might. Uh, that the scene is an indigenous political, that this is a scene of indigenous political empowerment is unquestionable. I think that's clear. Contingents have arrived from all over Ecuador to participate in the protest together. Their many colored Kanaye flags and slogan inscribed signs emphasize coordinated action. But there are also many hidden expressions of indigenous power. The Amazonian and coastal shamans uh, here and here, as well as the um, historic or uh, pre-colonial leader in the clouds above are all directing their energy to Vargas, not to Gutierrez not to the future president, but to the indigenous leader. And on top of all of this, uh, the presidential palace and the national bank have been transported from the center of Quito, the site of non-indigenous power, to the indigenous countryside. There are all sorts of folkloric things going on around, too. There are stories. This is a, a cycle of, of uh, folkloric stories here that's being presented, as are some of the other things going on in the background. Um, Tigua style painting, like other forms of tourism-oriented tourism arts and crafts, calls for a creative approach, approach to the anthropology of art. To explain the artist's goals or their aesthetic codes is insufficient, because the meaning that they encode in their work is not necessarily the meaning that their audiences get out of the paintings. Nor can this challenge be addressed by simply comparing the div divergent modes of interpretation, because they're both very real at the same time. Uh, both are right. They're both getting something meaningful out of it. The meaningfulness of the art must be taken into account, but this must be done in conjunction with an investigation of how that meaning mediates power-laden and historically contingent relationships between different groups of people. I follow the lead of Arjun uh, Padurai in his introduction to the influential volume, The Sh Social Life of Things. Arjun uh, Padurai uh, famously writes, even though from a theoretical point of view, human actors encode things with significance, from a methodological point of view, it is things in motion that illuminate their human and social context. In this case, the things in motion are artworks. The ultimate goal is still anthropological, to understand something about people and the ways that they interact with each other, think about each other, and stand in relation to each other. But my methodological approach is to seek insight through into these issues through an investigation centered around the things that mediate those relationships. So by way of conclusion, and to establish a more explicit connection to the theme of our conference today, I'd like to conclude with a few remarks highlighting the dynamic and mobile nature of the art about which I've spoken here. It's hard to imagine anything more mobile than tourist souvenirs. Uh, many travel long distances just to reach the market in the first place. From there, once they've switched hands, they become even more mobile, crisscrossing the globe with their owners. In the process of that movement, they come to stand for very different ideas. Perhaps they are seen primarily as a source of income by the producers, but they establish memories and relationships as they change hands and come to mean very different things to their new owners. I think something quite similar could be said about graffiti. Uh, I muse sometimes about the origin and destination of the graffiti I see painted on train cars, but even the image of Doctor Who stenciled on the sidewalk outside my home, literally immobile, has flowed across conceptual boundaries uh, that are ultimately quite similar to those across which tourist souvenirs move. I don't know what the artist thought as he or she inscribed the neighborhood with Tom Baker's face, 
But as I walk past it each morning, I deepen my relationship with that unknown person through the own, my own meanings that I read into the image. Thus, I find art moving uh, both emotionally and anthropologically. Thank you. systems uh, are not necessarily a reflection, right? They're constructions. And even Stuart Hall says that language is not a mirror for, for right. the people, right? So um, I was thinking that, <coughs> sorry, um, yeah, social processes shape out um, uh, art processes, and art reconstruct uh, social processes as well, but they also add desires, intentions, and personal motivations within the, within mm -hmm. the work of art. And I was, actually thinking about the, the, the opposite side. What if these guys are not really uh, being honest, if we can say about it, with the representations, and they're rather uh, trying to picture or portray a specific uh, way of, uh, uh, of the landscapes or the society, because you say there are no genes, and there is no mo modern uh, objects, so how can we tell this is actually reflecting reality? And, um, well, the Baudrillard's concept of simulacrum, right? I say, I, represent something to you that you might imagine I, I am uh, related to. Mm -hmm. So we both think that we are acting out reality, but it's hyper-reality, right? It's not fiction, but it's like an acting out of reality. And um, we are talking about tourist art, but um, that was like um, a question. Like, Do you think it are they are artists or artisans? Or is there any difference between artists um, I, I prefer not to draw a difference between artist and artisan, particularly because of this specific genre. Um, it circulates in the same ways that artisan goods do, you know, uh, carved, carved masks and bracelets and, and other things that people make. And yet this is very clearly representational in a way that, you know, bracelets or whatever or not, uh, but, you know, the striped pants you see in, in the markets everywhere. Those are not representational, and this is. Um, but it's circulating in the same way. So I think the genre itself is a challenge to the idea that there really is anything different about it. To me, uh, in both cases, what we're dealing with is, is creativity. Um, and these are, these are not honest in the sense that they portray reality. Um, that's, I mean, that's really clear. Uh, people do tend to treat them that way, though. You know, the artists, uh, or the, rather the, the tourists, all kind of seem to think that they are, because that's what they're after. They want authenticity. You know, they want reality, and they, they want to be able to show it. So I think that, that misunderstanding is kind of the key here. Everybody, um, everybody has intentions um, emotions, uh, motivations with regard to these things. Um, these things happen to be paintings, uh, but we could apply this to other, other sorts of, of goods, and, and especially artistic goods as well. Uh, everybody's got motivations or, or orientations toward the art, and it seems to be in large part through that that they understand the person on the other side. The artists understand the tourists through this. This is why they don't show, you know, literal reality. 
the tourists understand the artist through this, it's why they think it is reality. And so that's what I'm trying to follow up on here. I haven't, I haven't actually had enough time to spend with the artists themselves or in, in the tourist markets to, to elaborate on the, the, the details of that. But uh, hopefully, um, hopefully that's what happens next. I, I kind of have a follow-up question to what you said I mean, did it occur to you to look at the consumerism as a mirror to this instead of focusing on the artist who might be an artisan, mm -hmm. as it was pointed out, um, you look at the reception and who the tourist who goes there is? Yeah. Because it's, uh, I mean, it's Ecuador, it's how the, 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 the question is how the country has been promoted. Mm -hmm. And even you, who is, you are an educated tourist, an anthropologist who goes there, and even you cannot, uh, right. and even for the purpose of this conference, did not decipher who these representational uh, uh, personages uh, on the on the screen were. Mm -hmm. So, who do you think the the the, the tourist uh, who buys this uh, this art is? Well, it, it's hard to know. There's been an awful lot of study on uh, one side or the other. You know, the, the impact of tourism on the community, the impact of uh, tourist experiences on the tourists. But not very much uh, has been said about the, the way that those experiences flow together. Um, and because those experiences seem to be mediated by these objects, um, I think it's important to actually follow the objects themselves. That's going to be, I think, fantastically hard, especially to follow them, you know, follow the objects home to wherever the tourists are from. Uh, and I haven't worked out how to do that yet. But that's the idea behind uh, the, the quote I read from a Potter ride, that um, there isn't any, any inherent meaning in any of this stuff. Uh, people put that meaning in there, but because they do it, we can use those objects as a way to talk about both sets of people. Um, so that's that's my goal uh, or my my objective for studying the, the crafts themselves, rather than studying specifically this group of people or that group of people. I want to follow the crafts through those interactions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe memory more than memorabilia, but as a you know, as a social connection. I I just echo the comment that the three presentations were were excellent. But I uh, just a quick question for Ian, um, and I know you mentioned that. studies of communities that have been affected by tourism and um, in some it's a, just a disaster, um, totally uncontrolled development, so there's environmental deg degradation, exploitation, and it just, people come in, tourism is there for like 10 years and then the community is ruined and nobody's intrigued by the community more so. But Jerry is an interesting case because there was a community council founded in the early 90s. It's inside a national park and so there's a lot of rules that go along with that. And so um, I, I don't know that anybody was ever promised, uh, you know, modernization. It just was kind of a process that started happening, and people just went along with it. So um, I, I don't know what it. I mean, where I was at, you know, last summer was just a snapshot, um, and it's continually evolving. So you know, um, I don't know what it looked like in five years exactly. But, but there, yeah, there, there's been like. Some controlled local development there. I'd have to say that the, the people I talk to feel strong about the way that the community has been able to dictate. Uh, like for example, you know, when they put in power lines in 1998, 
uh, the community didn't want above ground lines because they thought that would make it look like a city and make it look ugly, so they managed to get these underground lines. Um, there's um, city codes against building structures more than two stories high because they also thought that would look ugly. And so this whole thing to try to maintain the uh, aesthetic integrity of the town and, and their ability to do that was because of the community council. sort of um, insurgent underlying pushes to, to maybe change the idea just a little bit, you know, uh, take a little bit of power away from other people dictating life, and, and just sort of explore the boundaries. The people who produce things like this painting are the successful, uh, you know, and, and sometimes quite successful. Um, painters who have more freedom to um, to explore some of those ideas a little bit more. You know, you see uh, protests against Texaco or, or things through the paintings themselves. Um, so it seems to depend a little bit on the money. You know, if you can afford to do it, you do it. Uh, and if you can't afford to do it, Yeah, I think that, that is a, that's a really good point and a really good question. I 
try to, there's a part that I'm going to put in there which tries to say that that's, I'm not sure if that's what's always exactly going on. I think that we should remember that there are sort of ways in which, you know, Brazil uh, is the model to other parts of the world, mm -hmm. such as uh, participatory budgeting in Puerto Alegre, or uh, sort of the more uh, sustainable or community-oriented planning in Curitiba, right? And a lot of mid-century <coughs> modernism comes out of Brazil as well. So I think there, in terms of if, how conscious the city is, in terms of, I don't see a lot of, within that Bushist discussion itself, saying, talking about North and South issues or only looking at Europe, you know? I think it's almost presented as, uh, it is, I guess the mass narrative is we are arriving on the stage, right? And if the stage is probably Western, right? Um, some comparisons are made to South Africa, to China. So there is this, what, there is this comparison to the emerging economies, to the BRICS, right? Uh, I don't think they're comparing themselves to uh, uh, more underprivileged parts of the world, it's, it's true. Um, so there is definitely the dynamics at play. I haven't thought too much about it. Um, I think they, the people producing these boosters standards do like to sort of compare themselves to uh, places that are deemed as successful in the North and the West, right? And I don't know if there's a lot of counter. If there's plenty of resistance against local things going on in terms of, uh, you know, what's going on in the favelas or uh, you know, insane amounts of speculation. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily housed in the work versus self sort of narrative. 